so that we'll post it later. So just a, I guess a heads up that that's happening. Um, welcome all to the NUG monthly meeting for March. So um, yeah, so just a heads up that we're recording, we'll post it on the, the meeting page afterwards. So if you prefer not to be recorded, then um, uh, this is probably to keep the camera off and, and maybe limit questions to, to chat. Um, that said, we normally go for a, a pretty interactive uh, format here and we will do the same today. Um, and because we're a reasonably small group, I think we can just unmute and speak up when, when you have something to say. We'll go through our uh, kind of usual pattern of, you know what, I missed editing something in the slide there, uh, of a win of the month. Uh, today I learned the user community survey was an artifact from last month's um, uh, discussion, although, uh, yeah, maybe uh, if you wanted to say something about it at the time. Uh, and we've got uh, a number of announcements and calls for participation. And then we're going to our topic of the day. So today we're going to have a, a look at some science highlights and that general process. Uh, so to kick off uh, our win of the month. So the aim of this segment is an uh, opportunity to, for, you know, for users to show off an achievement or to shout out somebody else's achievement that you're aware of. And can be big or it can be small. Um, you know, getting a paper accepted, solving a bug, uh, or I don't know if this will be in the announcements later. But I heard uh, Perlmutter stop charging until two weeks from now. That will be in the announcements. Um, yes, we'll talk a, a little bit about that uh, quite shortly. Um, yeah, would anybody like to kick off with? Some good news in the last in the last month. Something that something that you've succeeded in. And give a, a shout out to uh, one that I know happened, and I saw there was an announcement about it in the Nug Slack uh, yesterday. Um, Kudos to Shazeb, Justin, and a few others for getting the uh, latest, or nearly latest, the, the 22.11 release of the E4S stack uh, deployed on Perlmutter. So it's, it's quite a large stack. There are, there, there are literally hundreds of um, software packages in it. Um, it's all under a you know, module load E4S. Uh, there's some docs on sort of how to use it. Um, and in this, this latest build has been built for kind of multiple compilers. And there's also a, a CUDA based, um, what do you call it, variant of the stack available. So yeah, that was uh, you know, quite a, a significant effort and a, and a good outcome. I have something I can share. Yeah. I was gonna share that I, got hired at NERSC as a staff member uh, after being a postdoc for a year and a half, which is very exciting. Um, so I'm gonna be um, part of the user engagement team, um, working with Steve and, and Rebecca and others. Um, so hopefully you'll see more of me during these meetings and in the community more. My focus is gonna be on um, user community building, um, which you've been hearing a lot about. And then also one of the things I want to start working on is um, new user onboarding. Um, Rebecca is going to have me start looking at how users get onto the system. How long does it take them to start using the system? Do it, you know, get get set up and so so they can be productive. Basically, like the time to science, like how long does it take from becoming a nurse user to start starting to work on your scientific computing? Um, and what are some resources we can make to, to, to decrease the amount of time that that takes. Um, so if those are any of the things that you've ever thought about or have ideas or thoughts on, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, hopefully you'll see me around more. Um, but I'm very excited because I love NERSC. I've, as I started as a user uh, way back in 2019. Um, 
as a physicist, so I'm not a computer science person. I'm a physicist uh, by training um, while I was doing my PhD. So uh, it's it's not it's surprising to me that I work at a HPC facility, but I love it. So I'm very excited. So that's a big win. Yeah, that is great news and and great to hear. And congrats, Lippy. So so from the inside, of course, you know, I uh, already somewhat knew that that was coming. But what I didn't know was how long it takes to get through the HR process here. So it's really good to hear. Yeah, I, so I haven't technically started yet either. So I think that they're still doing some work. Um, so technically, I'm still a postdoc right now until the end of the month. But um, I, my mindset has definitely moved on. <laughs> yep. Congratulations. We're, we're happy you'll be here for, Thank you. for longer. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, I see there's a couple of uh, congrats in the in the chat as well. So that one's going to be a hard one to talk, but uh, anybody got anything else that they'd like to, to show off? Um, I don't have not too many wins of months because I'm trying to still compile you know, different models on Palmada, but uh, thanks to previous suggestions and comments. Whenever I get a problem, just throw in the compiler flag, allow argument mismatch, standard legacy, uh, yeah. and it works. So it was quite smooth the uh, last few weeks for me. And IO, again, on part of Matasco is just incredibly fast. It's really helpful. So it's yeah. 16, 13, 15 seconds on average to write down this uh, 52 gigabyte of uh, Let's see their file. So it really helps us to you know, shorten the simulation time and spend more time on thinking about science. Yeah, so actually that seems a, a really good segue into today I learned because there was a couple of tips there. So in a way, this is this is partly the flip side of the, the win of the month, which is that not everything goes smoothly all the time. Uh, but when things don't go smoothly, generally there's something to be learned out of it. And and you know, that's kind of what science and research is about, getting things wrong until we finally understand things well enough to get them right. Um, and and uh, I guess a, a, a corollary, corollary, yeah, bad pronunciation, um, to, to, you know, discovering things the hard way is also stumbling across in, interesting information. And Koichi mentioned uh, one there, which, I think we now have um, in the in the docs page a tip about it, but the Fortran, oh, sorry, the um, yeah, the, the GNU Fortran compiler has a flag dash f uh, uh, allow argument mismatch, if I remember correctly, um, and that makes a big difference when you're compiling. It, it, it's quite useful for even things like MPI, where you know, potentially the same call can be done with different types of arguments, you know, depending on whether you're passing, you know, your, your, your message is gonna be integers or reals or, or whatever else. Um, and a, a, a very strict Fortran implementation such as GNU Fortran will complain about that. So dash F allow argument mismatch uh, loosens the rules a little bit on that. And the other one you mentioned, Gretchen, was the performance of Scratch. And uh, yeah, that's uh, really good to hear that it's, uh, it's it's serving a good purpose. So the Perlmutter Scratch is an all, um, I have a blank on the, the name, it's not spinning disk, it's uh, flash. It's an all flash file system. So yeah, we're, we're still uh, you know, shaking out Perlmutter's performance. And so yeah, we have seen a, occasional uh, times when the file system performance isn't, isn't quite where it needs to be just yet, but that is being worked on. And when it works, it, uh, it, it really does work well. Um, anybody else got a today I learned or a, a, a tip or a discovery that they'd like to share? I, I had an interesting one that I and I learned and helped a user learn that uh, just because your loops have OpenMP parallel, does not mean you can just slap and and works, you know. Does not necessarily mean that you can just slap target on there and offload it to a GPU. <laughs> uh -huh. 
because uh, it may be calling other code that works just fine under under parallel on the CPU, but your compiler may not know that it needs to compile that other code to also run on a GPU and exactly how to do all the memory mapping and things like that. So, so just uh, if you if you're thinking, hey, I've got these parallel for parallel for or do loops. If I throw a if I throw a target on it, it should just go over to the GPU. That's not always the case. Yeah, I can see that that one. You're out of out of lexical scope for mm -hmm. other other routines. Um, that's the uh, exactly you... the re reason. Sorry, I I gave up. Yeah. I have one Fortran code. And the only parallelism it's using is just OpenMP Fortran. So I attended last year one of those, uh, you know, put into power model workshop and hey, oh, maybe I just throw in the flag and it's gonna run on GPU and no. It's a it's only one, you know, uh, doodle, but very long one and then calling multiple subroutines in the other code. So uh, yeah, right now I just gave up and then try to learn more about the code itself. In theory, it'll be possible to get stuff that, you know, more complicated stuff to go over to a GPU. There's just more work to it than just one thing. Yeah. <laughs> Did you um, stumble across or, or discover any, um, uh, I guess, indicators that you've got that problem or, or tips for finding it or, or resolving it during your debugging um, so far? So the, the way we found it started off as just an, an internal compiler error, right? So there's, it was a big Fortran code with a whole bunch of uh, parallel do loops. And he, he, you know, the user just threw target on all of them and then went, well, now the compiler just stops with an internal compiler error. And so it took us a little while of like pulling some things apart. And then eventually we ended up with a link time error because that code hadn't been compiled for a GPU. So that version of the procedure didn't exist. So it, it did take some, some digging to kind of realize that was what was happening. So yeah, if, if that's the kind of thing you're doing and you run into errors, it might be you're in a situation where it's just not going to be as simple as all that. Yeah. Coming up with a uh, internal comp compiler error is a interesting outcome. I wonder if the, the compiler's attempts to pull it all in um, yeah. just use too many resources. Something along those lines is my is my suspicion because it it was all in one file, so in theory it can see everything. And go, oh yeah, I need to compile this for the GPU, etc., and just ran out of whatever it was doing to do all the analyses for what needs to go where, when, and how to map things over, and all of that. So yeah, that's that's my suspicion. Hmm. So yeah, that's a that's a good tip. Uh, getting from parallel to GPU is. Uh, a little bit more complex than just adding the target. Plus, if you have a huge loop, uh, like what Koichi described earlier, uh, it might run out of a variable space or register space if you just blindly uh, add OMB target. Yeah. I found a, a new one uh, that uh, by default, dash MP only enables OpenMP multi-threading on CPU. Dash MP equal GPU by default uh, well, it's not the default, so you have to be explicit about the equal GPU to enable open API target offload. This uh, is coming yes. from uh, helping a user who is used to open ACC where uh, dash ACC automatically means GPU. Yeah. Dash ACC, uh, there is a dash ACC equal GPU, but it is the default that uh, dash ACC usually means uh, equals GPU. There is also equals multi-core and equal compare or something like that, I think. That's for the NVIDIA compiler, by the way. For NVIDIA compiler, yeah. Um, also, uh, I've noticed sometimes uh, the NVIDIA compiler uh, doesn't like dash G on higher optimization levels. Sometimes it just uh, gives a compiler, uh, internal compiler error, uh, trying to uh, put debugging information to certain uh, subroutines. I've seen this twice with the NVIDIA compiler. So uh, the trick is, uh, if it's a complex build system, just put dash G into the stuff that you want to debug, not all of them. 
not like uh, put in the make file, so dash g everything, uh, turns out uh, that crashes the compiler. I don't know if uh, maybe that's already fixed in the newest uh, NVHPT version. Uh, I think they already released 23.1. Maybe they're on the way to release 23.3 soon. I think the latest we've got at the moment is either 22.7 or 22.9. But getting yes. a, an internal compiler error like that is probably worth yes, having yes. a ticket for if you haven't already, because uh, that is that generally means some sort of a bug in the in the compiler right. itself. And I think it was dash D of dash O one or some combination of that that caused it to uh, crash. Yeah, uh, any any internal yeah. compiler error is always a bug, even if your code was mm -hmm. invalid. Um, but I, yeah. I will I will say that uh, you know the the combination of optimization and debug symbols is always a tricky one because the when it inserts the debug symbols, it may be trying to do so for code that it already optimized away. <laughs> right. So the, the mm. no matter what well, that's Tyler, what it does, uh, in contrast to dash G. So uh, it yeah. claims to uh, sorry, I have uh, leaf blowers outside. <laughs> So dash G opt in NVIDIA compiler claims that it doesn't change the assembly, the, the generated optimized code, but it inserts debugging symbols. Mm -hmm. I forgot if it happened with dash G or dash G opt or both, uh, but it happened at 01. Yeah, I, I mean. I, I do want to push back a little bit on the statement that any ICE, sorry, that's short for internal compiler error, is yeah. always a bug to report. If it's happening due to IO errors on nurse scratch file system, then that's not truly a compiler bug. That's the compiler just not knowing how to deal with a faulty file system. So reporting those are probably going to be ignored by the vendor. Don't. Oh, that's that's fair. If, if it I mean, wasn't, it's yeah, yeah, in, in yeah. theory, <laughs> in theory, all of their IO calls they should check for you know short writes and and short reads and error returns. That's not practical, and they're not going to put effort into that. So yeah. I've had plenty of you know big compiles where there are hundreds of files and such that you know I just have to run make five times before it fi finally completes uh, on days when the, the scratch file system's having a bad day. <laughs> that's that's Plus, fair. There, yeah. there are situations like where doing... you could encounter an internal compiler error where it isn't actually the compiler's fault. That's that's fair. Plus, I don't like doing bug isolation on this particular code because it's uh, that particular file has like 4,000 lines of Fortran code or something. Oh yeah, that that's all. That's the case a, a lot of times too. Yeah, is uh, sometimes it's really hard to isolate the bug, and in those cases, I mean, you don't you don't always have to file a bug report if it's going to be too much effort and it goes away when you fix your code or something. You know. So we should probably uh, start to move on to our next segment of um, announcements. We have a, a few at the moment, and there's a couple that are, you know, especially current. Um, and the first one is that you hopefully saw the email that went out yesterday about Perlmutter's charging holiday. So there's a, a few things going on here that are that are worth sort of knowing about, and and this is sort of all all in the email, so you can uh, read a, a little bit more details there. Uh, but yesterday during the afternoon, we changed a setting to uh, temporarily to disable a feature of SS11 in Slingshot 11. That's the, the, the network that, or the interconnect that Perlmutter uses. Uh, what this feature provides is performant uh, GPU to RDMA communication. So that's uh, remote uh, direct memory access. Um, you know, useful in, in internode uh, communication. Um, but there is uh, currently a, a critical issue in there which is being worked on. Um, and that was leading to some node failures. So we have for the moment disabled that. And there are a couple of side of effects that you should see from this. Uh, one is that if you were seeing jobs uh, failing with a node fail status, uh, yeah, particularly GPU jobs, they may well have been hitting this bug. And so um, this, this workaround should allow them to get past that, should prevent that from happening. Uh, however, it does substantially affect performance. So you might see that 
your code that uses GPU, uh, your GPU aware MPI, that sort of thing, um, uh, could run significantly slower. So we're anticipating that we'll be able to remove this in around about a week's time at the, the next week's maintenance. Um, but partly because of this and partly to you know, help us shake out some of these issues, uh, we'd like to encourage people to still run. Uh, and we recognize that if you know, things are going slowly, that's uh, you know, not ideal for your allocation. So we've declared a, a charging holiday for the next two weeks. So uh, all jobs on Perlmutter will run free of charge um, for the next two weeks. So, so please don't be daunted by the fact that performance on, on some jobs will be a bit slower. Uh, submit the jobs and take advantage of the charging holiday and yeah, this will help us to shake out other issues because of course we're yeah, quite keen to get issues shaken out as, uh, as soon as possible so that we can retire Corey as it's uh, you know, reaching end of life as well. Uh, and if you do hit, you know, problems, uh, let us know by opening a ticket. Before we move on, to, uh, are there any kind of questions or comments or things that anybody wants to add or ask about that? Sounds all, all, uh, all clear. Uh, the next kind of big current one is this year you hopefully have heard by now via emails and weekly emails and, and various announcements that uh, we have an updated appropriate use policy and code of conduct. And we need everybody basically to read and agree to the updated, um, you know, these updated documents. Uh, we still have, a, a, at least as of a day or two ago, quite a large number of users who haven't uh, read and agreed to them. And reading it and agreeing to it is very simple to, to see it that uh, the first time that you log into iris.nurse.gov, uh, it will it, it basically won't let you do anything until you've gone through this dialogue. It'll pop up a dialogue and, and present it to you. So we send out an email to all users who have not yet um, signed the doc. Um, last, uh, no, earlier this week. So uh, yeah, if, uh, if you didn't receive the email, that probably means that you signed the doc and possibly forgot about it, but it doesn't hurt to log into Iris and you know, see if you get the, the dialogue. If you got that email, and then when you log into Iris, you don't see the dialogue. We've had a couple of examples of that happening, that there are a couple of things that could cause that, but uh, yeah, you know, if, you, if you find any difficulty with it, um, open a ticket so that we can uh, get you know, visibility on that. Um, other big one is that Corey's retirement is approaching soon. So we talked about this in, in quite a lot more depth in the last month's user meeting. Um, Corey basically reached end of life in terms of its components and yeah, because of that, we uh, need to retire it. And so yeah, we're working pretty hard to get, you know, Perlmutter um, working well enough and, you know, prepare our users all to move off Corey and onto Perlmutter. Part of that, we're, we've had a few office hours session. There's another one coming up in a couple of weeks time. Uh, we also had a, a, a day of training last Friday on migrating from Cory to Palmada. And so this training is actually uh, recorded and available online. So the, the recordings and the slides are available uh, at this web address, which you can get to by pointing your smartphone or, or possibly a, a, a desktop tool at this QR code. So yeah, if you're not uh, running on Palmada yet, please give it a shot. Um, even if your code isn't GPU ready, Perlmutter's got yeah, over 3000 CPU only nodes, you know, each of which is you know, significantly more powerful than, you know, than a Cori k l node. Uh, they've got, I think the CPU only nodes have got 128 cores each, two, two sockets of 64 cores and they're full strength cores. So, so they're like a, you know, 
your Haswell type, um, you know, speeds at K and L type uh, scaling, and you know, even even more so. In fact, uh, other things coming up. Um, summer internships are available if you are a student or have a student who's looking for an internship. Uh, jump to, to this page uh, on our www under research and development internships. We've got a, a list of uh, projects that NERSC is looking for interns to work on over the summer. Um, there is a research software engineer association conference coming up at the end of this year in Chicago and submissions are open on that. Uh, there's a web address here for it. Um, there is a DOE cross-facility workflows workshop in just about a month's time in April. Uh, I don't actually have a link to, to that. Um, maybe check, check the weekly email. I think there's a little more information about that in there. Uh, also, NERSC is hiring. We have, we have great news. We, we've uh, filled one of our positions, thanks Sliffy. Uh, but we have quite a few other positions that we're looking to hire. So, you know, we've, we've found that uh, nurse users tend to make great nurse staff as well. So yeah, take a take a look, there's a, a link here. And we'll post these slides on the meeting notes afterwards, on the meeting page afterwards. So you can just click. Um, there's at least one other, because Brad was telling us before about a nurse Quattrain users group. Do you want to yeah, tell us more about that? Yeah, uh, so I dropped a little bit of information and some links into the chat, uh, but we're starting a new Fortran users group, the, the Fortran users of NERSC, so fun. <laughs> um, but uh, the the first event we've got planned is for April 4th. Uh, it's posted on the NERSC events calendar where we're just going to kind of have like a Fortran office hours and a initial discussions about, you know, what do people want to get out of the group? Uh, you know that kind of stuff. So uh, there's a, a mailing list. Uh, there's a, there's already a Fortran channel on the the NERSC users Slack, and uh, I also posted a, a form, a link to a a survey. So if uh, if anybody's interested in providing feedback, that's another way to do it as well. And you can always uh, reach out to me via email directly, or find me on the Slack or the mailing list or what have you. Feel free to ask questions, introduce yourself, and all that fun stuff. Sounds great. So that was April 4 for the office hours. Yes. Yeah. And I guess uh, going to Slack, the, the Fortran channel on Slack is going yep. to be a good first place for getting more information. Yep. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, that's, that's uh, really good. Fortran's, uh, I think, widely used and, and quite an important language. Uh, and you know, despite it, it, it seems to get a yeah a lot of dissing out there, but it's uh, it's actually a, a yeah a really nice language. It's it's, it's, it's uh, quite uh, it's, I, it's quite user friendly. I always I always forget where the original quote comes from, but uh, rumors of Fortran's demise have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, are there any other announcements or CFPs out there that people here know about? that other NERSC users might be interested in. If not, we'll, we'll go on to our next segment, which is our topic of the, of the day. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, NERSC science highlights. Starting out with uh, what are they? So, so every month in in this meeting, we start out in our winter of the month talking about you know, a little spiel about what it's about and and mention these you know something as a candidate for a science highlight, uh, which kind of does raise a, a fairly valid question of you know, what actually is that? Uh, what does it look like? Why does it matter? What sort of thing counts as a science highlight? Uh, where can I find them? And how do I get my work showcased like that? So for what does it look like? Um, uh, traditionally, they've taken the form of a single slide that uh, was presented to a, you know, in, in DOE reports that uh, 
describes and uh, you know, usually has some sort of a, a visual, some sort of a, a, you know, a scientific achievement uh, and a little bit about the significance and impact. And you can see in you know, this example at the top, uh, it, it's very brief, very concise, um, kind of eye-catching, just you know, points out the, you know, the key details and you know, has a few links to, to more information. Uh, more recently, we've been uh, uh, writing up some of the science highlights in kind of a, you know, a longer article form. And we have a, a page here, which we'll set, uh, share a link around to sort of shortly um, with an example of one of these articles. And so there's a, you know, a, a more uh, detailed, you know, science news type of writer. So, you know, it can take a couple of forms. And uh, basically what it does is it, is it describes in non-domain expert terms, uh, a scientific achievement and the significance and impact of that achievement. Uh, and you know, particularly, of course, it's, it's aimed around, uh, or you, you know, centered around nurse users. So you know, this is it's, it's highlighting work that used nurse resources, uh, either you know, nurse compute systems or nurse storage systems. There have been um, science highlights around you know, data collections using HPSS, for instance. Um, yeah, and or collaborations with nurse staff as well. So then why does it matter? Uh, actually, it's kind of pretty important, really. Uh, if you look at the NERSC mission here, it's a, yeah, the mission of NERSC is to accelerate scientific discovery at the Department of Energy Office of Science through high performance computing and data analysis, which is to say that the science is the reason that we're here. Um, and so, you know, paying attention to these in the form of highlights, you know, it's, it's, it's valuable, you know, both in terms of showcasing the work that's being done and, you know, helping to keep our attention um, and our focus, uh, you know, on our mission. So yeah, these get uh, presented to DOE in some regular reports and get used in our annual reports. Uh, it's good for, for visibility for NERSC. It's also good for visibility for you know, the NERSC users producing this science. Um, it's a good way to you know, get, get your actual work um, you know, showcased in front of uh, other NERSC users and also the, you know, the uh, DOE program managers and so forth. So and I thought it'd be nice to go through a, a few sort of recent examples and just talk a little bit about them. And a caveat here is that uh, yeah, I'm not a domain expert in, in any of these really, um, but the articles do go into some more detail and have links to further information. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised if in the room here, we've got some domain experts in at least some of these, which could make for some uh, interesting discussion. So, this is the one, this is the most recent one published just earlier this week. Uh, new math methods and Perlmutter HPC combined to deliver record breaking machine learning algorithm. Um, and the, the uh, I guess the, the summary of this is that NERSC users working in mathematics for experimental data and in earth and environmental science uh, came up with an approach for Gaussian processes that solves one of its limitations, which was that um, the yeah, you know, once once the the matrix gets big, once the covariance matrix gets large, uh, it becomes a little bit unmanageable. So they've come up with an approach that distributes this large but sparse matrix over you know a large number of Perlmutter GPU nodes. And so now the the individual submatrix uh, submatrices are small enough to be processed within a single GPU. And this suddenly makes a you know a, a much larger set. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, makes much larger problems tractable. So, and then uh, to demonstrate the um, the approach, the um, the, the mathematic, mathematics for experimental data uh, group worked with the Earth and Environmental Science group to actually apply this method to a large climate data set. Uh, it goes into the details here. I think it was um, uh, it was. Was a 
uh, data set around uh, temperatures, basically. Um, but yeah, so they demonstrated the ability to be able to, to uh, use this method to deal with you know, a huge volume of data coming out of your know, newer climate science work, which is, you know, there is a, a very large amount of data coming out there. So, and, and as well as just being able to deal with the sheer volume of data, uh, they also got a really significant speed up by breaking it down into sub matrices that could fit on the GPU. They were seeing something like a 25 times speed up over Cori. And yeah, which is, which is great. 25 times is a, is a really good result. And this work was just recently published in Nature Scientific Reports. Um, yeah, the article goes into a, a lot more detail, but it sounds like uh, to, yeah, to, these, to, to this non-domain expert, um, instead of pre-guessing what the sparsity pattern is, they're able to use this to actually discover the sparsity. Another one from a little earlier this month, um, shining a light on Electron's role in energy transfer among 2D materials. So, so this was an interesting combination of experimental work and simulation work. So, there, so, so this group is working with, um, with uh, 2D materials, so essentially single, single atom layer um, sheets. Um, so they've got a couple of layers, and one of the one of the challenges is heat dissipation through those layers. And they discovered experimentally that by directing, you know, certain I guess certain wavelengths perhaps of, of light at one of the layers, they could increase the heat dissipation by by a factor of more than a hundred, like like really really significant, so a couple of orders of magnitude. Um, and so the next uh, step was to develop uh, an actual understanding of what was going on and, and you know, build up a, a theory of this. And to do that, they ran a bunch of uh, ab initio simulations using Cori. If I remember rightly, uh, I think this one they, they did, was this one? Oh no, this one wasn't Secret 2K. Um, this was a, a, a custom code. So yeah, basically they were able to you know, use uh, quite a lot of processes on Cori to run simulations to, to actually understand what was going on and see the role of electrons in uh, you know, greatly, greatly increasing the energy transfer between the layers. Uh, and this one also got a write up in uh, this time in, in nature nanotechnology. Uh, this is an older one from, from last year and this is in the, the, the highlight slide format and this is one that was a snapshot in that, that earlier slide. You can see this one's actually an animated uh, slide and, uh, and a few of them are using animated graphics like this. Uh, this was some really interesting work using artificial intelligence, uh, or uh, I think it was a deep learning, yeah, deep learning model uh, alongside um, climate, uh, you know, more, more traditional climate science models. And they, they essentially used uh, deep learning to, uh, I guess, learn some of the um, uh, patterns here. Yeah, I'm not enough of an expert to know uh, exactly sort of how they did this, but uh, I guess it's like a, a physics, uh, we call it physics enabled um, deep learning model. And so, yeah, they're, they're able to use basically you know, a neural network to, with pretty good accuracy, um, predict some kind of key weather, um, uh, variables up to 10 days in advance. And so one of the great things about sort of, you know, deep learning and GPUs is that it scales really well. And this is partly why it's taken off so well. Uh, and so, yeah, they're able to, to scale this thing over, you know, 4,000 GPUs of uh, Perlmutter. Uh, and then once it's done the learning, the actual, you know, inference that, you know, making the forecast using the, the um, Deep learning net, uh, yeah, deep neural network is significantly faster than doing it in you know conventional numerical approaches. So so they saw like a, a forty four thousand time speed up by by taking this sort of combined approach. So yeah, that was some great work. Uh, 
Uh, another one, this one, um, actually, NERSC's own Kevin Gott, who isn't here at the moment, is in a, in a different meeting, um, was involved in some of the work for um, this WARPX code. Uh, it got a, a Gordon Bell Prize. So in high performance computing, the Gordon Bell Prize is an annual prize for uh, basically for, for your work done at really high scale that sort of pushes the it pushes the limits of HPC and, and advance, advances HPC in that sense, but while while still doing useful scientific work. Uh, so, so this is a code called WARPX, which is uh, being used in the development of uh, plasma accelerators, which are a, kind of a, a promising development for shrinking the, the size and cost of particle accelerators. Um, so WARPX is an ECP project. Uh, it uses a technique called adaptive mesh refinement, and it's built on top of uh, you know, an AMR library called uh, AMRX, uh, AMRX, AMREX, which has been used pretty heavily on Perlmutter, and you know, we've uh, seen some sort of good results there. So, but uh, the team was able to run at scale on four of the top 10 supercomputers in the world at the moment. So Frontier, which is the, the number one at the moment, Fugaku, which I think was previously the number one, or yeah, um, in, in Japan, uh, Summit and our own Perlmutter. And yeah, this ability, this, uh, the, these results got at the 2022 Gordon Bell Prize. Incidentally, feel free to, you know, uh, interject uh, yeah, if you if you're involved in one of these projects or yeah have uh, comments to add, uh, please do. Uh, so another one we got here we we actually on Perlmutter saw uh, you know some uh, nurse users were possibly the first or or, or close to it at least to break the exit op barrier. So we've been working towards exaflops for a while. And in fact, I think the exaflop barrier was recently broken too. Uh, so if exa, exa is 10 to the power of 18, um, flops is floating point operations per second and tends to mean you know full 64-bit, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, precision. But you know that, that sort of level of precision is kind of expensive. And yeah, we use it a lot because we need you know, the numerical stability, but it's not always actually necessary. And so uh, this team showed that for certain problems, they could use mixed precision and use a, a lower precision, even FP16, so 16-bit so floating point for some of the calculations and higher precision for other parts of the, the, um, the arithmetic. And Actually, there's a little bit more about this in the next slide, which is uh, uh, you know, a, a more detailed write-up of it. But so they, they sort of achieved two things here. One was that they used a submatrix method to break up a, you know, a very large sparse matrix and distribute it over, again, lots of Perlmutter GPUs. Uh, and by using mixed precision, they were able to do a, you know, a bunch of the calculations in, XP, in, in FP16, uh, which meant that they could use Perlmutter GPU's tensor cores, which gives a you know an enormous amount of parallelism, um, and so running on you know eleven hundred nodes, so forty four hundred GPUs on Perlmutter, they managed to crack the exaops barrier. So it was quite a quite a significant piece of work. That was that was also late last year. So yeah, that's just a a small selection of. Um, of some of the, high, the science highlights that have come out in the last six months. And they, yeah, they, they get published reasonably frequently every, every few weeks. Um, and where you can find them is on the www.nurse page under science. There's a, a sub page called science news. You can point, point your phone at this QR code and, and jump directly to it. And uh, see the list. So, so this is just the most recent list as of a, a day or so ago. The, this one, that, you know, a couple that we looked at just now. Uh, so the, the ones that we looked at, uh, you know, some of them were being published in Nature. Some of them were quite big achievements. Um, 
also, you know, a lot of highlight worthy science is things in progress or coming up as well. So some of these articles are, are talking about the work that's being done. Uh, for instance, the, the super facility project, which you know, allows um, compute facilities such as NERSC to integrate really tightly with experimental facilities uh, such as particle accelerators and you know, provide near real-time processing to you know, support work being done, you know, experimental work being done with uh, computational analysis. So yeah, so I highly encourage people to, I didn't uh, cut and paste the, uh, what do you call it? Didn't capture the, the, the URL to paste in here, but take a look at this webpage. There's some really interesting stories there. Steve, can I ask you a question? Sure. So when so NASC stuff finds some papers in, in those probably high profile journals and acknowledge NASC, is that the way you guys find study or science highlights at the NASC? Uh, so I think it's one of the options, but it's not the primary one that we use to find okay. science highlights. And actually the uh, it's a good, good segue to jump onto the next slide, Oops. which is mostly oh. the way that we find science highlights is by talking with users and, and you know, sometimes by you know, hearing rumors or, you know, uh, yeah, basically hearing news from nurse users about work that they've been doing. And we are very interested in um, you know, in hearing more of these. So we've got a form. So we, yeah, we would like to really encourage you to uh, submit um, work that you've done uh, as, a, as a candidate for a science highlight. Um, yeah, it's a good opportunity to, to showcase your work. Uh, it's also valuable to NERSC to you know, be able to showcase our users' work and show that you know, NERSC users are, are you know, making significant, significant science, uh, scientific advancements using these resources. Okay, so, yeah, actually, have... that's oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. that's kind of leads me maybe my second question. I'm just browsing through this initial form, and uh, I wonder. For me personally, I am interested as uh, because it's NASC highlight. I might be more interested in what language they use to write their model or what libraries they used for that model. Oh, and yeah. what kind of uh, workflow they use, any particular special queue or how many nodes, or do they do any parameter search for the uh, you know, optimum configuration of number of nodes and number of processes per node and those things, particularly for those, those big computation jobs. And if that this form has some optional sections like that, that's actually <laughs> more inter maybe more interesting for NASC users. You know, it's more uh, also some to add, add some kinds of relevancy or more connections because it's interesting for me as scientific curiosity, just reading other fields in the in the you know non-domain scientist uh, language, but still. Um, even more interesting to me. For example, yeah, I saw some, you know, those really nice works using machine learning and with the GPUs. And I just curious, are they, did they use Python? Or if it's Python, which library did they use? And those kind of indirectly also help me, my work as well. If some, some things they already used in a really big way, then maybe I could follow that example. So just must my, you know, uh, yeah. To sense that that might that kind of items might be interesting to be considered in those submission form. They need to know. Yeah, that's a that's a, a really interesting idea actually. Of um, as as well as the science highlight, you know, that that presents the outcome. Uh, yeah. Some details that other NERSC users can can use to, you know, inspire or influence their own work. Well, right, like like challenges as well. That, mm. Yeah, yeah. 
So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good idea. Um, yeah, kind of a, a, a going deeper. There is a part of this um, submission form where people optionally can provide us information with uh, of like what their workflow was and some more like details about on the nurse side of things. Um, so, you know, if you yourself and, you know, anyone who's here, if you share this with um, your students and collaborators, maybe encourage them to fill that part of this form out if they're submitting something, because um, then we can um, you know, if if their submission is uh, able to be highlighted, you know, on our website or whatever, we could maybe either internally with their permission share how they did that um, in another format, maybe via Slack or something else, uh, another platform. Um, so yeah, that might be um, really helpful um, to other users to to be able to understand what how they achieved the the thing that they did. Yes, that's right, Koichi, you found that in there. There's a, a part that it's not required if people don't want to share or don't feel it's necessary for whatever reason. But if you if you do use this form or if you ask your students or collaborators to use this form, maybe encourage them to at least give some information in that part as well. Yeah, maybe can you change the font of the question, like a bold font or something? <laughs> yeah, <or laughs> encourage it strongly. Yeah. We, I, I will encourage people. We can also always reach back out. I mean, once we have a contact with that person, it it opens things up for like a dialogue. So if if you know, I mean, most papers have a corresponding author in case someone is interested in what they've done more 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 in more detail. So um, you know, that's also just helpful. So we had yeah. possibly still have, uh, I think it was connected to the, um, to when we were moving to k &L in the early days of Corey, uh, a set of case studies of, um, you know, projects that had, that had migrated to k &L. In fact, we might well have them for Perlmutter as well in our, in our docs.nurse.gov. Uh, I'm not entirely up to date with, uh, with it, but yeah, that, that could be sort of a, what do you call it, a, a corresponding idea here as well. Just make, make case studies out of some science highlights. Of sort of a, a how to achieve this. Yeah, maybe for anything that's still a work in progress to the point that the, the completed sort of results aren't available yet, but like they're working towards it. And so that I think having a case study type thing would be really interesting. That'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. So, and I saw that uh, Lippy, you pasted the the direct link into the into the chat here. The link is in the chat, so, and I'm yeah. also gonna put it into the nurse um, to the general channel for the next the nurse uh, user group Slack. Um, and we can maybe we can just have it float around every once in a while. So if people lose track of this link, they can yeah. find it again. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So we're actually getting quite close to the the top of the hour. Um, so we should, before winding up, just a, a, a brief look at what's coming up. So uh, we have uh, uh, next couple of topics uh, that we have lined up is in April. Uh, Nurse Johannes is going to talk a little bit about uh, using Julia at NERSC. So, uh, if you haven't encountered it yet, uh, Julia is a, a fairly new language and it's, uh, its syntax, uh, I think, is actually a little bit inspired by Fortran, um, uh, yeah, amongst other things. Um, but it's a, it's a dynamic language, but it compiles, um, yeah, compiles down to, to code. So it can produce you know, very fast code, uses multiple dispatch. There's some, you know, it's, uh, it's it's a really nice language actually, and you know we have uh, some support for it here. Um, and then in May, tentatively, uh, Roland will tell uh, will give us a bit of a walk through NERSC's Jupyter Hub. So you may already use Jupyter.nurse.gov, and it's a, a really uh, convenient and powerful platform for accessing NERSC. And in fact, uh, it can provide you know, pretty much 
complete access, you you don't actually need to SSH in to nurse systems, depending on you know on your workflow. You can do you know, a bunch of stuff through Jupyter Hub, but it, you know, it includes a, a terminal ability. So yeah, we'll have a bit of a, a walk through that. And as as always, we are always interested in more topic ideas and especially in nurse users presenting some of their work. So if you have a topic idea or have some work to present, um, we'd love to hear from you. And there's a, a, a form here and a QR code to it to, to submit through. And that kind of ties up today. Um, We'll stop recording. Um.